us before we begin uh, this this morning? Unspoken, yes. All right, then let's all lift up our voice together. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace, we're ever so thankful, Lord, that we can come, Lord, boldly through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we have come here to praise thee and worship thee this morning, that you would have thy way, Lord, in every part of this service. Bless those that couldn't be here, Lord, those that are listening by the way of the Internet. I thank you, Heavenly Father, there's no distance in thee. And now we commit this in your hands, in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated at this time. I'm going to ask Brother Paul Obey to come lead us in the song service. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everyone out this morning. Beautiful faces. Praise the Lord. When I look around and see all good things. Turn to uh, 119 in the blue book. Where could I go? A 
living below in this old sinful world. could we go but to the Lord? <clears throat> Does anybody have a number up on their hearts this morning? That <clears throat> number 10 in the red, which book? That one there? In the blue book, number 10. Red book. Yeah. What key is that on? Take a glance. Would you? 
be free from the burdens of sin. There's power. So 
on Thursday here, and I decided to go there ourselves. So we spoke to her, and we explained to her the situation, and you know, that he had no control over the situation, none whatsoever. And basically, she said, you know, that it's a contract that he has to fulfill. And, uh, you know, I told her, I said, by withdrawing this out of the account, he's in the red. And I said, he has nothing to fall back on. So uh, basically, that was still the bottom line. It was his contract, and it had to be completed. So Gary and I left there with the feeling, and we knew that there was no flexibility there whatsoever. So we put a stop payment so that they wouldn't take out another one. And uh, we were just going to kind of wait and hope that he would get at least a damage deposit back. So this went on a few days, and I was praying one morning, and David and Goliath, it came to my mind. And I thought, where did David and killing properties is that gone? Yes. So I just, we knew we had no control over that because they're an empire. So this week we had to go deal with uh, his father's account and Gary brought the bank book to have it brought up to date. And when he came back in the car, he hadn't really looked at it yet, but when he looked at it, he said, Cop, he said, what's this? What's this? And I hadn't seen it yet, but when I looked at it, they had to put it back in his account. So I had, we had both prayed that the Lord would change the heart. And I believe he did that. I'm just so thankful. I give God the glory because when we left there, there was no hope that he was going to give that back. So I thank God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. rewrote my life mercy Mm-hmm. 
mercy. Maybe we could start with the chorus. Oh, yes, he is. He is able to do anything I ask, and he will. And I 
take a moment to thank the Lord too. Um, a lot of people know that I never had Before she hangs up, she never hangs up before saying, I love you. And those are words that I need it so bad to hear. And our God can do anything. And he's taken so many fears since then out of my heart. Oh, I just need to thank him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Which number? 269.
Elijah, do you have a song this morning? Prayerless times will surely come. The great apostle Paul declared, Men will be in pressure more than God. Apostasy is everywhere. Bye. 
Word. 
speaking about Jephthah's vow. And I'm sure when he made that vow, he didn't realize the depth of what he was saying and asking the Lord. He didn't realize that his daughter was going to come through that door. Sometimes we say things, we make vows and promises to the Lord and we don't realize what sometimes the depth of what we're saying is. But I believe God is going to try us and test us to see about a year and 14 months ago when my brother died I made a promise to him. I sat right with him and I said to him, I said that I would don't worry, I am going to look after my dad. Because you see, my brother looked after him and they kind of accommodated one another, helping one another. And I didn't realize all this time how much work that was involved. Just took it for granted, you know, until the responsibility laid on mine. I took it upon my shoulders. And I didn't realize Really, I didn't realize what I was saying, the depth of it. But I thank God this morning that he can still speak to you. And there's been, I don't know how many times that when I tried to do what is right for my dad, I always seemed to come away uh, not doing it with all of my heart and I feel condemned because of that promise that I made to my my brother and I realized that at a young age that he was 21 years old when he took us under his wing and there was a tremendous responsibility at that time three children and he became my father and I realized all the sacrifices and I look back at all the things that he did for me, took me, provided for me. And when I think, when I place myself in his shoes, there is a difference. It makes a difference when I place myself in his shoes. Like right now he's in a care home and, and, and when, I, when I think, if I was in that care home, how would I react? How would I feel? And I thank God that he can, he can really speak to you. And when I, when I put myself in his shoes, like it makes all the difference in the world. Like I just feel so a, a love and a compassion that I'm doing the right thing. You know, it's a burden. It's, it shouldn't be a burden to look after. And I look at my wife. She's, she's, she's been looking after people now for quite a long time. And I see the love and the compassion and her exampleship, how, how she portrays to the, the elders, the, the people that she looks after. And it, I, that's what I want. That's, yes. that's how I want to react. Not only to my dad, but to others that are around me. That's, I feel that that's what God wants. You know, it, it shouldn't be a burden. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't do, oh, I gotta do this again. And I remember I took my dad last week, I took him to the hospital. And I was there for five hours, and I thought, oh, five hours. Like, I couldn't wait to get out of there, you know? It was a long time, but I was impatient. You know, like, I didn't realize but that still small voice inside says, like, what? It's wrong. You shouldn't think this way. You shouldn't be that way. Place yourself in his shoes, like. Yes. And when I do that, it makes a whole world of difference. Mm -hmm. So I thank God this morning that he still speaks. And I thank God that see, we just got to be careful sometimes how we express ourselves because we are going to be tried and tested. And I thank God that He's still working in my heart today.
Stand and we'll turn the service over to Brother Fred.
praise the Lord. We want to welcome uh, Greg on and his, fi- and his uh, wife as well, and we see Brother York here this morning, and there's Nicole, and different ones has, has come in this morning, so praise the Lord. But the Lord is the same wherever he's at, and we're ever so thankful. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us in this hour, Lord. It's nothing of our doing, Lord, but except your spirit, Lord, speaks to us, Lord, then we know nothing. But, Lord, is when you spirit actually opens up things that our hearts rejoice in your word. And we thank you, Lord, for your word in this hour. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I just want to say that uh, I enjoyed that testimony that Brother Greg mentioned about his mother, or he's been adopted, but he calls it, you call her your mother, amen. Just to show the generation that Bud and Audrey has, has come from, and I know back then, in those earlier days, in the 40s and the 50s, that the Spirit of God was moving in a mightier way that in the sense of a prayer life than they do today. And there was a time for it, and God honored that. They, I don't believe you have to do it, but there was a, an, an instilling spirit to wanting to, to go and pray. And I've heard of other prayer warriors that have, have been in our assemblies, that they too, it's, it's a joy just to praise the Lord. And how wonderful that is. And, but then the Lord has moved on from the time of the net where the spirit was really moving into the hour to getting a bride ready for his second coming. And so therefore, there must be a time where God would start now to look more closely to bring his word on ground of things that has never been revealed before, but it would be here at the end time. And it brings me back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, who says that we refuse not him that speaketh, that spoke on earth, but how much more him that speaketh from heaven at the end time. And if God is speaking, he's not going to be speaking like he walked here on earth. He's not coming off the throne of mercy to, to do it, but he's going to anoint a ministry to do that with. And uh, that's the hour we're living in. And so everything is in the, on the forefront. God is bringing things on ground because we need to know how close we are getting to his coming. Because if we don't know when or don't know how, and all we know that there's going to be a rapture one day, there's a lot of things that takes place before the rapture can actually transpire. He's not going to have the rapture and then, well, I forgot to fulfill those parts there. We are living at a time that where God is going to open his word. First of all, before the word is meaningful, things in the earth and the condition has to be there to begin with, to be meaningful. And uh, this week was a bit busy. I was speaking with the brothers from uh, Newfoundland on Wednesday with Skype, and they too are excited about the things that God is doing in this hour. And and uh, last night with Australia, now to, to them, to us it's, it's uh, to me Saturday night, but to them it's Sunday morning. And they keep telling me we'll be in the rapture before you are because we're a day ahead of you. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just a saying. <laughs> but when the rapture takes place, one shall be taken and one shall be left. One shall be sleeping, one shall be taken and left, one working in the field. That shows the opposite side of the earth. So if the rapture is all going to happen at the same time. So no, nobody's going to have it first div to, to be in the rapture first. And so as I was speaking with the brothers from, uh, from Newfoundland, uh, we got looking at some things. In, if you want to turn to your Bible this morning to Matthew chapter 24.
I'll start at verse 26. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. Why would Jesus make such a statement? It's because the very eternal spirit showed him at the end time there would be voices on the earth that said you have to be in a secret place or to go in a, into a desert, a special place to be in the rapture. And really that don't make sense when you look at the scripture. If one's going to be two sleeping in the bed, one taken, and the other one is working in the field, it ain't in the same place. They're actually 12,000 kilometers or miles apart. One's on one end of the earth and one, the other one's on the other end. So therefore, it could not be, there is no secret place when it comes to when the Lord does come. And then we got looking into verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's not that it's going to be preceded with a bolt of lightning, but he's using as, he's saying that as an example, as lightning is real fast, quick, so is the coming of the Lord going to transpire. And sometimes we can look at the scripture, and we, we, if we're not knowledgeable enough in the scripture, we, we say, well, that's the second physical coming of the Lord. And some say, no, it's not then. It's when he comes for his bride. But it can't be both because both are two different events to begin with. And so therefore, for as lightning comes out of the east, when we look at when Jesus actually physically come with all the angels and the bride with him, it says, every eye shall see him. And in order for every eye to he see him, I could use a little globe, I suppose, but uh, words can do the same thing. That means when heaven shall be opened, the sign of the Son of Man be in place, it has to at least roll 24 hours, because I don't think from China they could see him if he's up here in North America, right? So that coming is not instantaneous in the sense of as a lightning coming from the east to the west. But there is a coming where he will come for his bride because it speaks about that when he sounds that trump and God has given him, the great eternal spirit has given him the authority to sound that trump. And when he does, the dead in Christ rise first. That won't take long. Well, be, if we can be changed in the twinkle of an eye, they can, be, they can have the resurrected body real fast as well. And we meet him where? In the air. The world will not see this, but it will be to the believers at that hour. Because when he comes for his bride, he's taking her out of here, out of the earth, because the great tribulation is going to be just, the week of Daniel is just coming up ahead of us. And... I'm thankful that the Lord has opened up our eyes to sometimes simple little scriptures means a whole lot. And I know I've ministered this a few weeks back, but when Jesus, his disciples were wondering, well, Lord, when are you going to come? When is all these things be fulfilled? And it's in Acts chapter 1 around verse 7. He says, it's not for you to know the time or the season. Well, if you, if you and I had been there, well, what, what, what would you mean by that? We, we want to know. Well, he said it for a reason. Yes, they might have been disheartened by hearing it's not for you to know. The time of the season the Father has kept in his hands. Because remember, they're standing in 33 AD. And they want to know when the Lord's coming. And we've gone over almost over 2,000 years of time they could not relate to the events up here 2,000 years further down. So it would have been meaning, Jesus could explain, well, at that time there will be airplanes. And I could see Peter, what's an airplane? Uh, what's a missile? What's 
I'm still, I'm waiting for that Google car. Or even cell phones that you can communicate around the world. They had no such thing. They wouldn't even know anything about it. So that's why he told them, it's not for you to know the time and the season. But although he told that to them, there would be a time and a season, because remember, the Father has kept that in his hand, that he would speak when that would come. First of all, the language that Jesus used with the disciples back then, the times and the seasons, today we would call them centuries and decades. So they wouldn't know the centuries. And down through the grace age and the first church age, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, we're up to the seventh. When would it ever be that the centuries would ever end? Unless God drops a thought in and brings the scripture with it, you'll never know. You can only guess. First of all, for you and I to know what I'm going to say next, things had to exist and had, the event would have had happen to know it. Because in the same chapter we're looking at in Matthew 24, when Jesus speaks about, I mean, verse 32. Learn of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Now, when the fig tree puts forth a branch, it means Israel would be back in her land. Now, let's say you're standing in 33 AD. It's a true scripture. That branch one day will put forth a branch. But in 33 AD, they were looking at being dispersed rather than being brought together. And down through the grace age, that scripture was looked at. But that scripture only came into being in 1948. Israel became a nation in one day, just like Isaiah spoke about it. That happened. I was just one year old. I didn't witness it, but I, I'm of the generation that knows about it. And so are you, because it's all in our history now. That is, becomes history. But what does that all have to do with what Jesus said, the time and the seasons? has very much to do with it. If you look at it in the right light, First of all, Israel had to be a nation in, the, in a nation in one day to be in the land because what we're going to read next, it says here, so likewise when you shall see these things, know it's near even at the doors, plural. Now, a long time ago, we didn't know what the doors were. Was one door, well, the door to heaven, maybe. But doors is plural because he's going to be saying something that's related to this time frame. The Gentile door is going to close, and then the Jewish door for the 70th week of Daniel is going to be open because God's going to speak to them through two prophets. But here's the whole thing, the key to understanding why the times, or in other words, the century would come to an end, is right here. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all things be fulfilled. Now, I asked a question this morning. Is a generation a century? Is it 100 years? No. A generation, according to biblical scripture, is 70 years old, 70. And the generation is not when you're born as a baby. If we look at it, what happened in the wilderness when Moses was bringing out that new generation, if those from 20 years and on up will be, is that generation that will see all things being fulfilled. Can the rapture happen tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, this afternoon? No. There's things we're going to look at that has to transpire, be in place before we get there. But this was now that scripture that he told his disciples on that day before he was leaving, he says, it's not for you to know that time and season, but how that would be a people at the end would know when the centuries would end. Now we've got to look at decades too. So we know by just that simple scripture is revealed the centuries have ended. 
there will not be another hundred years go down the road because Jesus said there's only going to be a generation before everything is fulfilled, before the millennium even starts. How many can see that this morning? It's so simple. But God just had to open the eyes on it for us to see it. Getting back in Hebrew. Those that refuse him that spoke on earth, how much more him that speaketh from heaven in this hour. He spoke from heaven after he left the earth for a short space of time to the apostles that was on the earth at that time. Where did Peter, where did Paul, James, all of them get the revelation that they spoke in that hour. They spoke some things that Jesus did not speak. But again, there would be a fivefold ministry at the end, according to Ephesians, that once God brings her into a place, she'll start to see from the scriptural standpoint where she's living at. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when Israel became a nation one day, there will not be another century to go by. So what's going to happen between that time frame till that generation is actually fulfilled? All right. The in this out in, in during the the early church, it was the Apostle Paul in Romans and Corinthians. Talking about the bride now, and the bride only, that we must all come before the judgment seat of Christ. And if I was to ask in the religious world this morning, where is that? When is it? It's an, is it an unknown? Yes, if we haven't been looking in, uh, into the scriptures about the things that op- has revealed in these last few months or this last year. The time, well, we can here read some scriptures. That's in Romans chapter 10, 14, verse 10, it says, but... Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand, A-L-L, before the judgment seat of Christ. And another scripture. Okay. All right, I'll just use this here one. The other scripture is talking about that we, everyone is to give an account in First Corinthians, well, here, maybe Corinthians chapter 5. I just didn't have, well, maybe I could click it. Yeah. 1 Corinthians. I think what they used to be. Second Corinthians, sorry. Five, ten. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone receive the things done in the body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. Now, there's another aspect of coming before the judgment seat of Christ. If we were all coming at the same time and receiving the same reward, that could be done quite quickly. But we're not all receiving the same reward. It depends on how we lived down here and how we treated God's word. The judgment seat of Christ is not there to judge your salvation. It's there to judge how you've lived, what you've done with the God's word, 
and therefore, based on those conditions, God will now uh, credit to the each individual believer his measure of his reward. I said, that's all fine. That's good. I understand that. But how many deceased bride sin saints has died since 33 A.D. till now? They're probably in the order of 10 million. And if they're all going to come individually, can you do that in five minutes, 10 minutes? It's going to take a space of time, isn't it? Now, knowing that it's going to take a certain time factor for all these saints to come individually before the Lord to know what they've done to receive their reward, then, praise the Lord, is it all going to happen to begin with when we all go up to the rapture in heaven? No. Well, you got scripture for that? Yes, we do. Let's look at this morning, 2 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 1. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's the one that had the revelation on the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Now there, which appearing? And if he's going to judge the quick and the dead, well, hold on now. What's he talking about, the quick and the dead? The quick in the scripture refers to someone that's been born again but is alive in a mortal body on the earth. That's your quick. The dead is the dead in Christ. So the Lord's going to come as his appearing. He's not only judge just the, those in heaven, but he's going to judge those here on earth as well. When that seventh seal is broke. Now, if, you don't, if you're not aware what the seven seals are, it's in the scripture. At the time when that seventh seal is broke, that's when silence is in heaven for a space of half hour. It's not a half hour time. It's a space of time in which is going to unfold in it the judgment seat of Christ, that angel coming down of Revelation chapter 10. He sounds his voice. Seven thunders utter their voices. Then... At that, after that transpire, then the bride, as a type of John, is going to prophesy to tongues, nations, and so forth. So these things have to transpire before we go up in a rapture. Now, first of all, if we're all going to appear at the judgment seat, it's, 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 he has reserved a day for it or a time for it. It cannot be just anywhere, anyhow, any which way. If the judgment seat was during the grace age, at what point would he have to wait for the last ones to come in? So is the judgment over the whole grace age? No. There's other scripture that we're going to look at that points it is going to happen within that half hour silence. Now when I say a half hour, don't get in your mind it's only... 30 minutes, it's, a, it's referring to a space of time and God, how God looks as time. So therefore, while Jesus is on the mercy seat, he's on the mercy seat pleading, you're in my case. He's our high priest and our advocate. While he's doing that function, he's not doing the function of, of the judgment seat. How many follow? So Jesus, he is that high priest. He seated, he seated on the Father's throne. But when the last predestinated bride seed is in, then according to Revelation, Jesus comes off of the Father's throne where he's been interceding for 2,000 years. He's given that little scroll, which is the, is, it has seven seals on it, which has the name of the redeemed, showing redemption as far as the bride's concern is over. It, every bride has come in. That don't mean others will be saved a little further on, but they will not be fine linen or bride. They will be another category of saints. Because look at the souls under the altar that were killed for the Jews in World War II and, 
and previous history. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ, but yet it says they were given white robes, eternal life, because of now he's God that makes the requirement. Us Gentile thinks everything has to come through Jesus Christ in order to have eternal life. Well, what about the Old Testament saints? They died before Jesus ever come. But he went through the lower part of the earth to preach to them to tell them he was that perfect sacrifice. Now I'm getting away from what I'm looking at here this morning. So now, the judgment seat of Christ cannot transpire. Jesus is not in two functions up in glory during the grace age. He's on that mercy seat, the Father's seat, for you and I. He says, I go prepare a place for you. Where I am, you can come also. So he's done that. But when he breaks that seventh seal, you are now in the Revelation chapter 5. And in the fifth chapter, that's where we see him breaking the seals. Now, I don't want to get, you can preach a dozen messages just on the seals. But there is seals when he has pro broken the last one. And in verse 12 of that fifth chapter of Revelation, there's a multitude in heaven, angels, saints, the beasts that are there before the throne, they're all saying to him, worthy to receive power, dominion, blessings, and honor, and wisdom. That's right here once he's finished his mediatorial work. Because when he's finished his mediatorial work, yes, there's that transitional period, but then God, Jesus is going to be ruling in the millennium. And as we was talking to the brother from Newfoundland and, and different brothers also last night, if standing here, just up the road from us somewhere, it's told to him in heaven, you are to receive power and wisdom. But if I take you back now to 33 or in 30 A.D., when Jesus said one day, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Well, why does he need power when the grace age ends? We must understand he was given power and all authority concerning for our salvation. That's what he spoke about when he says all power in heaven is given unto him. It was pertaining our salvation. When he's up on sitting on the, on the Father's throne, He's our high priest. He's not controlling the universe. He's, he's got his hands full, that's sort of one way to put it, with all the, those people that would come through 2,000 years of time. And wisdom, he had wisdom when he walked here on earth. They tried to catch him, the Pharisees and them, and, and the, the, the religious leader of that day. They're always in opposition to what God's doing. And they said, well, who should we render this coin to? To Caesar or to God? He says, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, or render to God what belongs to God. And they shut their mouth. That's the gift of wisdom there. But yet, here in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, he's given wisdom again. Well, I thought wisdom, you don't lose it. But that wisdom that he had there was the wisdom how the church needed to be conducted and brought through time. The wisdom that he receives in, that, in heaven before coming down to, that, down to the earth in angelic form, that wisdom is the same wisdom that Solomon had was wisdom for ruling. And so the wisdom that is given to him in glory in, in Revelation chapter 5 verse 12 is wisdom to rule in the millennium like Solomon ruled. Do you see the difference? Yes, God could have given him all that, all at once. Boom, there it is. But he first was a prophet, a priest, and king. He's all three, but it's in its, each in its own period of time where he will be in those functions. Jesus is not king of the millennium yet. We're not even in the millennium. And so therefore, that cannot be. 
Now, when I mention in Timothy, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. At his appearing and his kingdom. So therefore, there has to be a time, a place. We have to look at scripture that's really meaningful because we just can't say, well, it means this. We have to bring scripture to identify what is actually transpiring. And that's why it's been sitting all along for 2,000 years. Jesus spoke that parable in Luke chapter 19 to his disciples and the people who were there. In that 12th verse of the chapter 19, he speaks in, in this term. He says, it's like a nobleman that went to a far country. He didn't come to America, South Africa, and all those places. He went into the spirit world where he was going to sit on the Father's throne. That's the country that he's from. And he went there, and it just doesn't spend him dealing with the being on the mercy seat, but it speaks about that he went to a far country, and it shows the end result that when, it, when he went to that far country, he was going to return, and having received the kingdom, so he would take the whole grace age that he's up in the air in glory. But then one day, he was to receive, he given the authority to receive it. That's in your Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, where all in glory says they have power and glory for you to receive. It's for that kingdom, that millennium rule. And he was to return. But to return, the, the following verse talks about he came and he delivered pounds. To ten servants, not twelve, that he called in 33. But here at the end time, Matthew 25 says five wise, five foolish, that's ten. The pounds means revelation. God once again would start opening up the scriptures to whatever vessel he wants to use to make understand where you're living at. That was a preparatory for verse 15 of that 19th chapter. And in, and if we want to turn, well, do I have it here? I'll have to go get it. Luke. I'm waiting for that rapture there to get better eyes. Let's see. It naturals. All right. So he returned from uh, from the king. He was to receive. He was to go to receive a kingdom. He didn't give any more detail. It's just saying he was there for a long time. But now, when he comes to the fifteenth verse of that chapter, it came to pass that when he was actually returned, having received the kingdom, where did he receive it? In glory. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, that he's given the authority to rule, power, dominion, blessing, wisdom, and so forth. So having received, he returns where? To the earth. And while he's here on the earth, then, at that time, when he's on ground, he commanded these servants to be brought before him. Well, if he's on ground and he's asking the servants to come before him, that's your living element of bride that's here on the earth at this time. That's because he's going to, because when he brings that first servant, he says, you were given one talent, uh, one pound, and you increased ten. He's not saying, well, now you're saved. No, he's saying, because you had one, ta one, one pound and you increased ten pounds, you'll be ruler over ten cities. It's speaking about rewards. What is that? What's he doing by giving rewards? You're before the judgment seat. He's judging the life of that servant. That's what he's doing. And so that servant is now going to know before he's, the rapture even takes place that he's going to have be ruler over ten cities. That's your quick. 
Because the quick means there has to be alive. There will be an element of those. Now, here when he says servants, it's, I was asked the question, well, is that only for the ministry? No. He's, remember, a parable is a type. It doesn't go into detail. It represents the living element at that time. Well, where is Jesus going to be well, uh, well, and that, uh, coming in the form of an angelic being? Well, well, if I'm not that same place, how could I get judged? They missed the understanding. When he comes, he has one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea. That's universal, worldwide. He'll be dealing with every bride, living, mortal bride saint at that hour to be brought before his judgment seat. You and I, the bride of that hour, are not going to be in the tens of millions. Not even half a million. Well, do you know the number? No. But it's definitely a, a smaller amount. While through that angelic being that is spraying Christ before us for that judgment seat, the actual, literal Lord Jesus Christ, at the same time, he is now judging all the deceased bride saints from 33 AD, and that's going to take a bit of time. So that's why he sends that angel down here to us while he's dealing with the deceased bride saints for their reward in heaven. Hey, how long does it take to go through 10 million people? Ever conducted an interview? Do you do that in a split second? You can, can you process a... A thousand people in, in ten minutes. I just just threw now I'm just just don't go by number, but it's just as a, to give the point across. If he gave ten seconds to every one of those deceased bride saints, and remember, in glory there's no night. He can go twenty four seven. It would take him three years. For everyone individually to appear before him to give them their individual rewards. That's why he's up in glory de dealing with the deceased bride saints while that angelic being portraying Christ, being portrayed down here, is dealing with the living element. Well, you, you say, well, I don't understand that. Well, one day Paul was killing the Christians. And then he, I seen a bright light that he knocked him to the ground and he was blinded. He says, who art thou, Lord? And he says, it is Christ whom thou persecute. Jesus didn't leave the mercy seat to do that because Paul explains it in chapter 26 of Acts. That was a vision that he saw that Christ was being portrayed to him. Now, if God could do that to Paul, he can do that at the end time when he's dealing with the living element on the earth, sending an angelic being. First of all, I'd have to remind us this morning, in chapter 22, Jesus says, I have sent my angel to testify of me in the churches. Where did he do it? When did it happen? Huh? Well, we don't know. Maybe we don't want to know. But if he sent his angel to represent him, to speak for him, he doesn't have to leave the mercy seat, so he sends an angelic being that can portray the vision of Christ to whomever, whatever, and whatever he wants to do during the grace age. Well, he says, that's, I don't believe that. Well, hey, go to Exodus. God says to the, the, the Jews that was being brought out of Egypt, he says, I sent an angel before you. He will speak for me to you, and you better obey his voice. Because if you don't, it's not going to go well for you. So if an angel could speak for God, could not an angel speak for Jesus Christ while he's on the mercy seat atoning for us, that he needs to direct the church. He's not leaving the church. Now, it's not, Jesus is not everywhere present, nowhere absent. Only the great eternal spirit that's invisible is everywhere present, nowhere absent. 
Because if Jesus is everywhere present, nowhere absent, if we're going to be like him, hey, great, I'm everywhere too. Nowhere absent. Because otherwise he said that we would be like him. Father, make them one like we are one. Hello. All right, anyway, don't want to go down too further down that road. But now I'm getting back to that one in, in Timothy. It talks about that he's going to judge the quick and the dead. That's two groups, living in an element and a deceased element, at the same time, in the same, at that day or in that period of time. While he's doing that, he said, Paul says, it'll be at his appearing. Well, it can't be when he comes in his physical second coming because he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. That's not judging the bride. The bride's already been judged by then. Like I mentioned, I think to get the point across, it's easy to understand this way here. Once this has taken place, then we are ready to be changing the twinkle of an eye and the dead in Christ rise first, and we together go up to heaven. When we go up to heaven, the judgment seat can't be there because, as I expressed it before, what man is going to judge his wife after he's married her? If you're looking for trouble, try it. But he's judging the bride prior to the wedding. Not judging her for faults, but he's judging her for her qualities, right? And when you and I went looking for someone to marry, you're not going to say, well, 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 this was negative, this is negative. No, you're looking for certain, you were judging for certain qualities you were looking for, right? Vice versa for the women than the men. It works both ways, right? No? I just wonder if you're asleep or not sometimes. So therefore... He's not going to judge his wife, so therefore the only place that the judgment seat of Christ can take place is being made ready before he actually physically come for his appearing of catching away the bride at that time. And remember, it's only for the bride. There are other categories, and I don't want to get into that this morning. They will be judged later on in time because there's, there's also white robe category and fine linen. The, the dress quality is a difference. The bride has made herself ready. She has fine linen. While the white robes have not made themselves ready, not ready that you're saved, but not ready to know the rapture, the time, the seasons, the things that's in the scripture. I mean, if, if no one's ever going to know it, then why have those things in the scripture to begin with? But the bride will know where she's at and where she's living at. The white robes, they're saved just as much as the fine linen because they believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember, the blood of Jesus Christ is imputed to you and I. It's given. While the fine linen, we have to put it on. Not that we're doing it, but through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the revelation of his word is a garment what is that garment for? It's a covering, right? Now, I hope there's no Trinitarian here this morning. But let's say, for some reason or other, two men are found, or two women, doesn't matter. You can't, don't discriminate. Are found in heaven. And one has the revelation of the Godhead. There's only one person. And the other one comes up, and all there's three of them. And they see one sitting on the throne, and I can see the Trinitarian saying, where's the other two? Well, that's like feeling naked or foolish when you're actually before that presence of God up there. So it's, that's the best example I can use. That's why that garment covers that you're not ashamed of what God has given you in Revelation. Because there are things that was taught years and years ago, way back in the, the dark ages, 
if you be up in heaven, you start mentioning, th- let's say you have to burn uh, a can- so many candles for the saint to come out of purgatory to go up into heaven, you're going to be found, in French we say, fuss fondue, or, 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 or ashamed, because there is no such thing. It was just a man's doctrine. All right, well, I don't want to go over time or preach too much at one time, but the revelation of concerning what we're speaking about here this morning, the judgment seat of Christ taking place here, that has nothing to do with what the thunders are going to speak because we don't know what they are. This here judgment seat of Christ is known because it is written. Romans chapter 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Luke chapter 19, it's in the scripture. So that's not a hidden thing. Yes, when that angel, when the seventh seal is broke and times for the bride is, the numbers to be in the bride is, is finished, yes, there will be that voice of that archangel that sets the voice of seven thunders, and we don't know what they are. Now, the voice is not, hey, I'm here. It's a message, a prophetic message for the bride, for the soon, immediate events, just prior that we're going to be changed in our bodies. We're not going to be changed in our body, and then we're judged for our reward. It's before it takes place. And like I mentioned as well, When is the wedding itself? When are we actually married to Jesus Christ? You and I are married when we're changed in the twinkling of an eye, and the dead in Christ rise first, because the bride he's marrying, he cannot marry a bride member that's in a mortal body, because we are to be like him. He marries a bride like him. So the actual marriage itself takes place at the rapture itself. Then we go to a wedding supper to feast with him. No, it's not going to be chocolate cake or steak or things like that. We're going to feast on God's word, what we require and need for ruling and reigning with him in the millennium. I got a mention in glory. I'm going to walk on the streets of gold. And before God had revealed things, people thought they were going to be up there, a beautiful, shiny gold mansion, walking streets of gold. My, this is great. There's none, nothing like that in the spirit world. But your faith tried as pure gold. Well, all right, maybe I've said enough for this morning. And uh, This is an hour, yes. I long for the days when the power of God moved in the 50s or around that period of time before and the prayer life. I always wondered how at Azusa Street they prayed all night. If I ask you this morning, can you come and we're going to pray all night? If after an hour I have two or three of you, that's about it. But it was the Spirit of God that was on them to do that. It was for that hour God was doing something. Then he moved in a miraculous manner. But now he has to bring the bride to completion. Somewhere his word has to come to completion. All this has fit together. But there is going to be up ahead of us, all the gifts are going to be placed in the bride. If he placed the gift now in the bride, as he did in the 50s, We'd have our eyes on the gift, and we wouldn't care less on how on what is word and getting ready. The two, you can't have both at the same time. So he's getting the bride ready, and there is coming a day ahead of us. These gifts, not not that they disappeared, but I mean, in the abundance that he worked back then. I wish that would have been in those days, but the Lord saw fit not. But the, like Brother Jaime says, the best is yet to come. The bride's not going out in a whimper. 
She's going to shine as the stars of heaven. Now, if it's just the miracle side that makes you shine, did the people of the world says during the 50s and the days that the mighty gifts were taking place, did they say, this is the bride that shines? No. Most of the time they talk, they were saying, these are quacker holy ro- or holy rollers. But when the Spirit of God comes, and that angelic being come with that rainbow, that is the Spirit of Almighty God, it'll be a prophecy in the, in the order of what the Old Testament done. If God uses in some members of the bride to prophesy things, and the events actually takes place, the world will take note. These people know their God. Because nobody knows that these things were transpiring. Now, it's one thing for prophecy, prophesying about the word of God and opening things up. But at the end, God's going to leave her as a witness. And they're going to do miracles on the same level as two prophets in the week of Daniel. They're not going to say, I'm going to prophesy, thus saith the Lord, uh, you shouldn't be there. They're going to say, let hail fall tomorrow at this time. And I can see the people in the news media, oh, these idiots trying to do something like that. But when it transpires, they'll be dumbfounded. And then after a number of things transpire, they'll say, these people know their God. They speak and he does it. Just like in the days of Moses. It's going to be a short time. Not, it's not going to save the world. But God's going to leave a short amount of time in testament. Here's a bride that I've, I've schooled, raised, and now they're ready. And he sends it out for a short space of time. And the world will say they'll shine. That's why the kings, do you think Trump would ask someone of the bride to come to speak to him today? What about Prime Minister Trudeau? You think that might work? You're not going to have to go get them. They'll be coming to you. And when it says, thou must prophesy before kings and nations and so forth, hey, the world is big. Yes, but CNN, BBC, CBC will be coming to the door and saying, how do you know these things and these events that are transpiring now? It's all leading up to a point. To, uh, I'm getting a better stop. <laughs> Enough. That's for another message. But I thank the Lord what he has given us in, in this hour. Eyes to see. If you're hungry, it's when, the, it's when you're fed, you, you wanna, the Lord brings you want to see more. But when you're fed crackers all the time, the same thing day in, day out. I remember the residence that I was in, in the Catholic Church, there wasn't no food there. It was just formality. No disrespect to the people, but God was not in it. And he... He brought each and every one of you out. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand to our feet this time. Lord, I just pray that what we spoke about this morning, Lord, may be simple enough to understand at least uh, an overall picture of the things that you have and things that are coming up the road for you you to fulfill in this hour. Lord, just take the words that were spoken. You used it or you would see fit. I ask it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. Have your musicians uh, to come and we'll maybe sing a hymn or, or so if someone has a need. That's just as important. Because God looked at the last predestinated seed. in for it. Short memory, so. Reach out and t-
Most important, know that we're saved. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand this time. I want to ask Brother Jason if we dismiss us in a word of prayer this morning.
Christ. 